Good afternoon. Welcome to the Winter Show's cultural program series. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Helen Allen. I'm the executive director of the Winter Show, America's longest running art antiques and design fair. This year, our 67th year, we're uh, proud to present our first online edition of the fair. So I hope that after this program, uh, you'll take a moment to uh, tour the virtual booths and viewing rooms and, and hear everything that our, our dealers have to say about the wonderful treasures they have on display as well. Uh, as many of you may know, the Winter Show is wholly owned by and benefits Eastside House Settlement, one of New York's longest running community service-based organizations. Uh, Eastside House in the past year has had to pivot and in addition to serving 10,000 children and families every year to help them meet their career and educational goals, this year we've really had to kind of change our focus to uh, help the neighboring communities uh, battle uh, COVID-19. And as such, we've put together a wonderful series of programs, everything from putting uh, laptops and Wi-Fi hotspots in the hands of students uh, to feeding tens of thousands of people every week. I hope you'll take a moment to look and learn more about Eastside House on our site uh, after this program. I'm thrilled to have with us today curator, author, scholar, Glenn Adamson, uh, and joining him, uh, John Moore's Cabot Chair of Art of the Americas at the Boston, at the Fine Art Museum of Fine Arts of Boston, uh, Ethan Lasser. So thank you both so much for joining us. I'm very much looking forward to learning about craft and American history. Uh, seems very appropriate for the winter show. Uh, and we're delighted to have you with us today. So Ethan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thanks so much, Helen. And uh, great to hear about um, the great work of, of East Side House. And also just want to thank you for keeping the show alive during this this tough year. You know, I was thinking this afternoon about everyone in this crowd will know what it feels like to open those big doors, uh, wooden doors at the armory, and you walk in and people are toasting their wine glasses. And uh, really, you know, we miss that. You usually walk out into a blizzard or rainstorm. Uh, we miss that, but the, sh the winter show week, Americana week for me, Antiques week, whatever you want to call it, it's always, always about seeing old friends and, and fellowship. And Han, I'm glad you have created the forum for that uh, tonight, even in this uh, strange year. So happy to be on with an old friend, Glad Adamson, and to see many old friends in the crowd. And um, my job tonight is to introduce Glenn, and uh, he'll, he'll then speak for a few minutes, and then um, we'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll ask him some questions, and then we'll open the floor to you. And Glenn is many things, as Helen says. He's, he's senior scholar at the Yale Center for British Art, and he's a curator a critic and a and writer. But really, I think that um, Glenn is that rare scholar who's not only contributed to in advance, but really created a field, the field of craft studies. And uh, he's done so in part through his work in museums. Um, Glenn's worked as, as director of the Museum of Arts and Design in New York, as head of research at the Victoria and Albert, and as curator at the Chipstone Foundation uh, in Milwaukee. And I followed um, Glenn uh, into, I took his role after he left. Uh, and uh, now Glenn's working in a variety of institutions. He just opened a show, which I hope we'll hear something about uh, called Crafting America at Crystal Bridges in Bentonville and uh, lots of digital programming for you all to check out associated with that show. So Glenn's a curator. He's also hosting a podcast now, a great um, podcast called Design and Dialogue, which you can find three times a week uh, co-presented with Friedman Benda Gallery. And most of all, and what we're here to talk about tonight is Glenn's work as writer and critic. Many of you will know his columns in Apollo and Magazine Antiques, which I think have energized our field. And for me, reminded me of all of the links between objects from the past and issues from the present, of the present. Uh, Glenn's also um, the author of five major books on craft, including the latest volume, which we'll discuss tonight, Craft in American History, subject uh, this weekend of a glowing review in the Times Book Review. It's a book that tells the story of America through the eyes of its artisans. And Glenn, over to you. So happy to be here. 
Yeah, well, likewise, uh, Ethan, and thank you so much, Helen, uh, for having both of us here tonight. It's a particular pleasure to have um, Ethan, Ethan as my interlocutor tonight, because as he's just said, uh, we have a lot of history in common, and we also have the history of craft in common. That's something that we uh, share as, a, as an interest, and so I can imagine no better person to talk to um, as my book uh, enters the world. Uh, so here it is again, uh, Craft in American History, just out from Bloomsbury. Um, Ethan kindly just mentioned uh, a couple of things that I wanted to uh, highlight as context for this book. One is my longstanding role as an editor at large for the magazine Antiques, for which I have a, a, a column every issue. And um, I have to say that that relationship was extremely important to me intellectually in coming to the material of this book. Uh, so like the winter show itself, a long standing and extremely important edifice of uh, knowledge and expertise in this field and long may it continue. Uh, so I wanted to say hello uh, to Greg Sirio, the editor there and the rest of the team at Magazine Antiques and thank them for the support, um, both of myself and of course of the Winter Show over the years. And then also, as Ethan said, we're just about to open this exhibition called Crafting America, confusingly similar in title to this book, <laughs> um, which is actually a post 1940 survey of craft in this country. So it's very different because it's an exhibition and obviously has a much shorter time frame as my book, which is what we'll be talking about tonight, uh, covers craft in America from the revolutionary period to the present. So that the Crystal Bridges show is much more um, focused, I guess you could say, in its chronology. But boy, there's still a lot to cover. <laughs> and so that's, that's a, um, an exhibition of more than 100 artists um, and I think notably diverse in its inclusions, uh, not only in terms of types of object, but type of person. And that's one thing that the two projects have in common. So if you happen to be anywhere near Bentonville, or if you, as Ethan said, just wanna check out some of the online offerings connected to that show, which I curated with Jen Paget, uh, please go and have a, have a look at that as well, uh, just opening in a couple of weeks. Um, but um, onto the topic at hand, um, I thought I might start just by talking about the two images on the cover, one of which will be very well known to Ethan, because in fact, I think Ethan, you're the first person I footnote in the book because of your excellent article. There we go. It Ethan. also hangs uh, first front, front and center at the Art of the America's Wing at the MFA. Exactly, your, your parish. So it's a painting everybody in the audience will know, of course, Paul Revere's uh, port, sorry, John Copley's, John Singleton Copley's portrait of Paul Revere. And um, anything I could say about it perhaps would be over familiar to you. I'll just highlight one thing which Ethan has pointed out and many others as well, that it's a portrait of a craftsman not only reflecting on his work and his role, but also literally reflected in his work. And one of the reasons that I put it on the covered uh, in addition to its iconic status, um, is that I wanted to really emphasize that this was above all a book about people first and objects only secondarily. Um, when Ethan mentioned that it's the story of America told through the eyes of its craftspeople, that is really a very literal description of what the book is. A lot of it proceeds through kind of capsule biographies and the narrative is really propelled by protagonists who are always skilled makers of various kinds. Um, and the reason I juxtaposed it to the quilt, which is by Jessie Telfair, it dates to the early 1980s, but it refers back to her role as a uh, civil rights activist in the late 1960s and her um, experiences on the wrong side of, of racism in the American South during that period. Um, the reason that I wanted to put these two uh, images on the on the cover and delighted that Bloomsbury agreed with that decision is that in some ways they seem radically separated, not only in time, obviously 200 years apart more or less, um, and in space, North and South, in demographics, a white man, a black woman, in materiality, a silversmith and a quilt maker. Um, yet they also have so much in common of which maybe the most obvious thing is both are images of protest although the Revere portrait obviously is only an image of protest indirectly because we know what Revere would go on to do is Midnight Ride. But of course, he's come down to us as perhaps the most famous of all American artisan radicals um, who, um, who essentially pushed for change, political and social and cultural change. 
Um, and then Jesse Tel Telfer is obviously material expressing that tradition, that um, long-standing trajectory in American craft in her own work in no uncertain terms in this quilt, which incidentally is in the collection of the American Folk Art Museum here in New York. So um, a lot of differences between these two things, but also a lot of similarities, which point to the central role that artisans have had in American history, not only as the people who built the nation, but also as the people who often um, transformed the nation, even as they have been the repository and often the project, projected subject of traditionalism and conservatism. So there's a real paradox there where craft on the one hand is representative of the past. And if we think about how it functioned in the period of the colonial revival when Revere was taken up and championed as a kind of avatar of early American identity, that's quite clear. And yet craft always seems to be present at moments of change, moments of innovation, um, if you think about prototyping practices in industry and scientific context, craft is often at stake there as well. So craft has this very um, complex, fascinating role in American life, where it, it seems at the one, on the one hand to be looking back and a reflection of the past, a repository of the past and of um, rearward facing identities, and also as being quite literally the tool uh, from which the future is made. Um, it's also a fascinating subject because it is so shot through with fictional elements, despite the fact that it is so materially assertive and factual. So I often like to say that craft is one of those things that you can't spin. And particularly if you are a craftsperson yourself or an antiques dealer or a collector and you know what you're looking at, you just can't hide poor worksmanship, right? People will always see it for what it is. It's unusual in that respect. It's a kind of um, sort of like athletics or musical performance uh, in that it requires years of training uh, prior to the delivery. And when that delivery occurs, it is extremely exposed and therefore very vulnerable. And I think quite psychologically intense for that reason, um, which is maybe a funny way to describe antique artifacts, but I think an accurate way if you're open to them. So all of that is factual, but then of course here we're looking at this um, sort of fanciful portrait of Betsy Ross um, with a group of other women sewing the uh, United States flag, which I'm sure most people in the audience know that she did not, alas, in fact, invent or make. Um, that's obviously the legend around her, um, which was really propagated a hundred years later during the era of the centennial in 1876 by her descendants. Um, so unfortunately, Betsy Ross, who is the other early American artisan who is a household name, um, is not actually famous for the thing that she should be famous for, but she ought to be anyway, because she um, was widowed young and ended up being the um, lead proprietor of an upholstery shop for decades, despite being remarried uh, more than once. And, you know, um, in fact, making flags as well as upholstering furniture, all the other things that upholsters did in those years. And that obviously was quite a signal achievement, although not a unique one for a woman at that date. So the point I'm making is that craft is bound up in questions of fact and fiction, uh, symbolic representation, and also functional consideration at the same time. It's also um, important in American history because of its obvious oppositional relationship to industry. So here are two images of Lowell, Massachusetts, the famous um, site of innovation for machine production of textiles. Uh, you see a couple of the um, women who were um, working in this context in the 1830s, I think is the date of that um, image, uh, probably 40s, actually, 1840s. Um, and you know, a famously terrible work environment, loud, incredibly long hours, somewhat dangerous, and yet, people flocked to these factories because they found them to be preferable, um, both uh, from the point of view of income and also from the point of view of reliability, found them very preferable to farm jobs, which I think to us would seem much more um, craft intensive. So we would normally think of this as a story of a passage of the economy from a craft basis to a machine basis. But um, if you think about it for a minute, of course, you would not have had an industrial revolution without craftspeople driving it because those machines were built in the first place and innovated by craftspeople, people with extremely uh, strong uh, metalworking and engineering skills. 
Um, and even the operatives in many of these factories also had a fairly high level of skill, not so much um, necessarily operatives on spinning machines. They certainly worked furiously, but I'm not sure that you would describe them as members of the so-called labor aristocracy, which is to say the upper echelon of skilled artisans working in industry in the 19th century. But having said that, there were many, many people that corresponded to that description. And if we think about the history of labor unions in this country, which really develops in the late uh, 19th century, um, serving a purpose that guilds in this country had really never played, certainly not in the sense that they did in Europe, um, you can see that skill is uh, employed in the context of union management relationships very much as a hierarchical tool, so a kind of structuring principle for um, the political economy of the American working class. And one of the main things that I was trying to do in the book really was to describe multiple narratives of craft and weave them together. So yes, the kinds of antique objects that we see at the MFA Boston at the Winter Show, but also the history of organized labor, also the history of marginalized demographics, uh, such as women, such as African Americans, such as Native Americans, particularly those three groups. Um, so here is somebody who was both a woman and, uh, at least when she was born, an enslaved uh, uh, African American, Elizabeth Keckley. Some of you may know her amazing story. Um, as I say, born into slavery, but ultimately was able to gain her freedom uh, through her own skills as a seamstress, uh, relying on some of her clientele to um, affect her release from servitude, then moved to Washington, D.C. Um, through, again, the incredible quality of her dressmaking, became intimate with Mary Todd Lincoln, subsequently produced an autobiography um, published after the war about her relationship to the Lincolns. And also amazingly, this is something I didn't know before researching the book and maybe you're not aware of it either. She also made dresses prior to the Civil War for the wives of Jefferson Davis and Robert E. Lee. So during the war, you have this amazing situation where at least as far as I'm aware, these three women, Mrs. Lee, Mrs. Davis, and Mrs. Lincoln were all wearing Elizabeth Keckley's dresses, which shows you how much craft slips through the lines of ideology and political conflict that we normally think of as being uncrossable in this country. A fascinating story, and I think very emblematic in lots of ways. Um, I do spend a lot of time talking about the history of black artisans in this country, both during and after the period of enslavement. These are two images from Hampton Institute um, showing the emphasis of um, on vocational education for young black students at that time, just after the Civil War. Obviously, Booker T. Washington emerges from Hampton, um, becomes the leader of Tuskegee Institute, and really becomes the spokesman for this kind of accommodationist approach to manual training as a means of uplift, is later criticized by W.B. Du Bois and others for advocating uh, an approach to black education that will essentially relegate African Americans to um, being a permanent underclass who only have manual skills and aren't um, white collar or indeed intellectual workers as W. Du Bois certainly was as a sociologist and philosopher. Um, and so that's another really good example of the kind of complexity that craft narratives enter and um, continue over time. And even today, you could say there's a vibrant argument out there going on about how much the government and individual uh, schools should invest in vocational education for disadvantaged students. Is that doing them a kindness because it's giving them meaningful roads to employment, which is really the Booker T. Washington position? Or is it an unkindness because it is stereotyping them or profiling them racially or otherwise and fitting them into a certain path in life that they will never be able to escape? So craft is, of course, again, implicated in all of these questions. Um, for what it's worth, Frederick Douglass had a very clear position on this uh, stated earlier on, which I actually used as one of the titles of a, one of the chapters in the book, which is that, um, as he would have put it, Negroes, so African Americans must learn trades or die, because he felt that in the reality was that uh, during that period or later in Jim Crow era, really the only property that a, a, an enslaved person or um, a black person subjected to the racist culture of that time, the only real property that they had might not even be their bodies, it was only their skill, because that was the only means that they had of leverage. And indeed, for a black um, artisan at that time, you know, your skill was the thing that kept you out of the cotton fields, which were quite literally killing fields. So that shows you how important craft is in that context. 
Um, you can say similar things for the story of craft in Native American history. This is an amazing picture um, of a man that we now only know as Slender Maker of Silver. And it's another great uh, image of fact and fiction being woven together. So he's surrounded here by um, concho belts and other jewelry that he did in fact make. Um, but the picture presents itself to you at first as being a kind of emblem of authenticity until you realize that it's completely staged. So it's a fake painted backdrop, that sort of table with the blanket over it and the cactus are essentially props, um, studio photo photography props. And probably this picture was actually taken at a US Army base. And indeed this kind of jewelry was developed by makers of this man's generation, specifically for the market of Spanish, Mexican and um, white American military uh, personnel and the various hangers on and attendants of that, um, of that military presence there in the Southwest. So we look at this image and think, oh, this is the traditional craftsman. But actually what we should see is somebody who's highly adaptive to the circumstances in which he finds himself. And again, using craft as the tool for um, achieving livelihood under obviously the terrible and often genocidal conditions that Native Americans were subjected to in the 19th century. So then jumping way ahead, because <laughs> um, I'm trying to keep this short, uh, we can also think about the ongoing complex role that craft has had in relation to gender history and also to industrial history in the 20th century. And there's no better focal point for that perhaps than Rosie the Riveter. Um, another topic around which there's a lot of misperception. For example, I didn't know this before researching the book either, but that image on the right, the famous poster, was all but unknown until the 1970s when it was taken up by feminists to mean something totally different from its original meaning, of course. It only seems to have hung in the windows and walls of one factory in Pittsburgh during the war. It was seen only by a few hundred people, so it was not the icon that we assume that it was of the period often. Also, by the way, she doesn't seem to be riveting anything. So the association of this figure with Rosie the Riveter um, is only by association to the famous song and then the Norman Rockwell painting that you're seeing on the left, which is of course at Crystal Bridges. So that's another thing you can see if you make it Bentonville. Um, but it's, it's just um, maybe worth pointing out that even at this very late date in World War II, riveters were considered to be highly skilled craftspeople. And of course, women went right into that role because of the labor shortages of um, the, the war with of course so many men being drafted and overseas in the conflict and riveters were not alone. There were many, many industrial artisans who were crucial to the war effort. It, very much in the same way that you could say craftspeople had to jump into the um, breach and make personal protective gear during this COVID crisis, um, you know, in fab labs across America or just sewing masks at home. This kind of craft as a, as a form of readiness and um, coping with crisis is something that has gone on through all of American history right down to the present. And speaking of the present, or at least very recent history, I just wanted to close with two images of craft and flag imagery. Um, so this is a woman, I, I can't actually remember her name off the top of my head, I apologize, but it's a woman who was so taken with uh, the ascendance of President Trump to the Oval Office that she made a flag-based quilt and sent it to the White House as a gift. So this is her being covered by a local journalist. And ultimately what happened is that the quilt went to um, a senator uh, from her state. Um, but it's just really worth thinking about the fact that no matter what your politics are, probably craft is something that you will embrace in your life and feel pretty positively about. And I really like to contrast that image to this one, which shows a contemporary artist there on the right, Sonia Clark, engaging in a in the project of collectively unraveling a Confederate flag. And what she does is simply hang a commercially bought flag, the stars and bars uh, from the Civil War era on the wall of a museum and invite members of the public to stand next to her and unpick it with their fingers, nothing but their fingers. And she says that almost always what they say is, this is really difficult, meaning the flag is hard to unpick. And she always says, yes, exactly. So, you know, it's a material metaphor for the difficulty of undoing historic systemic racism. But, you know, just think about this, that this project, which I think most Black, Black Lives Matter activists would find to be inspiring and meaningful and powerful. And this project, 
by this other individual maker could not be further apart on our political spectrum. And of course, one is an act of making, the other is an act of unmaking, very interesting pairing, but they're still basically engaging with the same materialities and you know, hand skills, hand work. And I have to think that there's some common tissue, some commonality there that we can build upon. So I perhaps somewhat controversially called the last chapter of the book, Can Craft Save America? Which is a phrase that I picked up from a group of students at Warren Wilson College. And when I saw them having written it on the wall, I thought, what an amazing question, like save America from what and how, you know, how would that work? But it seems to me very evocative and very symbolic of, you know, a country that's obviously seen a lot of trouble recently. Um, craft, in my view, has been one of the few bright spots. I would say that even during the pandemic, we're going through an incredible craft revival, probably the strongest one that's happened, maybe even in our history, certainly the most diverse one that's happened in our history in terms of participation, somewhat fueled by the digital revolution, fascinatingly. And, um, to be honest, I can think of no more relevant topic for thinking through not only America's past, but also its present and probably its future too. So that's what I'm gonna say. And now I'd love to hear your questions, Ethan, and then uh, hear from all of you out there. Thanks. Great, thank you, Glenn. Uh, I think we can take the slides down. So much to unpack there. And, you know, Glenn, just to, be, to, to begin, just to make sure we're all on the same page, because some people are familiar with your work here, some aren't. Tell us, you know, it wasn't, it's not art, it's not work, it's not labor, it's not design history. Why craft? Oh yeah, that's a great first question, Ethan, thanks. Um, why craft? Well, there's really nothing that means the same thing. You know, it, it's, it's a word that everybody readily uses and applies probably rather indiscriminately, but I try to embrace most of its everyday vernacular meanings. It's interesting to me that the, etymological roots of the word actually go back to the German word for power. So mm -hmm. the word craft with a K in German still means power, like a power plant, an electric plant is a Kraftwerk, for example, which is why the band is called Kraftwerk for the techno fans out there. Um, and so it, it, in some ways it simply means capability or potency, human potency. Um, we also see it in the term witchcraft. Um, but it's come to mean something fragile, weak, and also dead set against industry for sure, and art maybe, not so much anymore, but certainly um, at the height of modernism, you did not want to be a craftsperson if you thought you were a fine artist. The two were thought to be quite mutually exclusive. So a lot of my work has been precisely around those problems. You know, it's, I, it's maybe a little bit of a complicated position that I've tried to uphold in all of these, um, books and exhibition projects. But basically what I'm trying to do is champion the concept while also accepting the baggage that comes with it instead of trying to shed that baggage away, which I think is what maybe people of an earlier generation might have wanted to do. And to me, the baggage is kind of the interesting stuff. And that's what, in a way, the whole book is about the baggage. Yeah, and we'll get, we'll get to the baggage. You know, one of the things, I think when you see the title of the book, you, you have some sense that this is going to be a, a history of objects of, uh, you know, decorative arts and furniture, clay, silver through the ages. But of course, as you say, it's not that at all. It's a, I like how you put a series of capsule biographies. And, you know, I think some of the people we encounter in the book are familiar. Revere, Paul Revere, Rosie the Riveter, Martha Stewart is in there. But, you know, there's some pretty surprising characters, too, um, who I hadn't really known. I think of... Um, Jane, I think is James Pennington, the author of The Fugitive Blacksmith. Uh, so an enslaved artisan who uh, eventually writes an account of his life. Or um, my, my favorite is Caroline Brooks, who's a butter sculptor in the Centennial, uh, who, who famous for her, her work in butter. Uh, but my question is, you know, tell us, tell us two or three of the um, kind of surprising or inspiring characters that you encountered in the course of your, your research. Well, those two are, are good ones. And of course, it's also worth mentioning that some of the household names who turn out to be craftspeople aren't thought of in those terms. So right. Frederick Douglass would be a great example because he started life um, as a ship's caulker on the docks of Baltimore. And it was in fact the relative mobility, I won't say freedom, but the relative mobility he had as a, um, as an, a wharf artisan that actually allowed him to gain his escape. 
so that was one of the reasons he felt so strongly about craft as a kind of tool of empowerment because it literally had been that for him. Um, but I mean, let's take Caroline Shaw Brooks as an example. Um, so there she is, 1876 Philadelphia Centennial. We all know about this event. Um, and she's representing the dairy land. And what better way to do that than to carve butter in front of a live audience. And so that's what she ends up doing. The butter has to be refrigerated on the grounds of the fair. And then she literally sculpts it um, with people watching her and then actually has a pretty decent career after the centennial sort of taking the show on the road in a sort of, you know, um, what we might now think of as a kind of country fair circuit. Um, and the reason I liked that story was um, partly just because it shows that the usual catechism of, you know, wood, metal, clay, fabric, glass, that there's a lot more <laughs> to the materiality and mediums of, of, of craft than that, but also because it shows you how a woman at that date could almost take the stereotypes of femininity and invert them and turn them into a tool of professionalization which is something you see over and over again in many of the stories that I tell in the book, that things that seem a little bit trivial or possibly even a bit silly like that um, turn out to be pathways to professional achievement. And of course, Martha Stewart would be the apex predator version of that, right? And um, I, I always think of, uh, I have to admit that in writing the whole book, I don't think I ever had more fun than writing the part about Martha Stewart, partly because there's so much fantastic stuff that's already been written about her. My favorite example being an article that was entitled, She's Martha Stewart and You're Not, <laughs> which sort of says it all, right? But there you have somebody that's taking the aspirational quotient of craft and delivering it in such quantity and with such an expectation of perfectionism that no one could possibly hope to meet it and yet she's building a multimedia empire out of it that in and of itself outweighs the entirety of the studio craft movement in financial terms. So what do we make of that as craft historians? That's the kind of puzzle that I try to work out in the book. Yeah, I think you tell us that we inevitably, you can't achieve the how, the, the, the kit that she sends in quite the way she pictures it. <laughs> right, yeah, it's, a, it's the impossibility is, is built into the product. Right, right. But, you know, fast, I think there are other, like Rosa Park shows up uh, in this. So they're, they're, they're points of intersection between people we know for, for other things uh, and, and craft in this book. And that's what made it so surprising to me. I guess, you know, you mentioned baggage. And, you know, it does strike me that um, we're used to coming at material like this through, a, you talk about the utopian projects of craft through a kind of um, uh, happy history, right? Uh, or at least an optimistic one. And um, there are moments of that, but this is by no means a um, sort of rose colored view of uh, making. And, you know, you, you really bring us actually directly in, uh, into engagement with, with the worst parts of our history, with slavery, with racism, uh, internment camps, uh, various forms of oppression, with um, war. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you can say a bit about uh, what was at stake uh, in that for you? And was there a moment of kind of epiphany when you realized that you were going to have to take on the most uncomfortable parts of our past? Were you, you know, thinking about historians in other fields who are beginning to do this? What led uh, you down um, that, that, uh, that road? Yeah, so, you know, that maybe is a great place to bring back the... Um work that I've been doing at the magazine Antiques, because that column is, it's literally called Critical Thinking and Difficult Issues. But when um, the magazine decided to call it that, it was actually Betsy Pakoda, I think Greg's predecessor is the editor. I thought that's a little too on the nose, like are people really gonna wanna read something called that? But the whole point was to take an object that just seemed really uncomfortable and evolve a narrative around it and through it. Um, like one of the very first objects that I talked about in that column was a nightstick that belonged to the first chief of police. And so far as the uh, New York police were organized, he was the first chief. And um, Joseph Matzel is his name. And it's an incredible object. I mean, it's, it's a ceremonial nightstick. 
and it has a sort of sheriff's badge looking piece of metal stuck into the end. So it looks sort of like a medieval mace. I mean, it really looks like it could do some damage. And I wrote about it, not during the uh, George Floyd murder protest, but an earlier uh, sort of chapter in that history when the Ferguson riots were happening. And um, thinking about, you know, militarization of police and police violence and how we think about the state's monopoly on violence. So that was the kind of thing I was thinking about anyway before I started writing the book. And so that was a very natural pathway into it. And I guess the only thing I can say when writing the book is that if you really open yourself to the idea that you're telling American history through any lens, what you're going to see is a lot of inspiring, joyful, uplifting narratives and a lot of dark and regrettable and tragic circumstances. Of course, that would be true of any country, but maybe especially of ours in some ways that we have this incredible extremity of, um, you know, light and darkness. And so craft just became one of those lenses for me, I guess. Yeah, and I think, you know, there's a, there, there are moments of really bracing um, honesty in the book. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about, I, I saw this particularly in um, uh, the way you think about our tr the treatment of Native American makers and uh, Black makers during slavery and after slavery, you alluded to this a bit with uh, the industrial schools. Um, but, but tell us how, you know, in a sense, craft has been almost weaponized, even as people have found agency within it. Yeah, you know, the, the great example there, at least in, as far as the Native American story would, is, goes, is the Carlisle Industrial School. So this is a situation where, I mean, it's terrible to contemplate, but basically it's, it's really like what happened to indigenous um, so-called Aboriginal people in Australia who were famously abducted from their families and assimilated into white Australian culture. There's been all sorts of reparation work done about that. And there's such high visibility that even we here in America know about it. You know, it's one of our big narratives probably about Australia. Well, the same thing happened here. And the Carlisle Industrial School was one of the main places where it happened. So, you know, there's nothing complicated about it. White um, people deputized by the government just went to reservations and kidnapped native boys and girls brought them across the country to the Carlisle Industrial School and then other industrial schools, Carlisle's in Pennsylvania, and, you know, made them take off their Native American costume and put away all their traditional uh, habits and um, put them in uniforms and then taught them all these basically, you know, normative um, craft skills, just like the other industrial schools, like the ones Booker T. Washington was involved. So that's a great example, as you say, of craft being weaponized as a tool of acculturation. And um, it's just heartbreaking to read the narratives of people that were that went through that experience. Um, and yet at the same and it's at the same time, you know, for many of them, the actual possession of the craft skills was almost the only thing that they got out of the experience that they considered worthwhile. So again, you get that doubleness mm -hmm. in the story. Right. Yeah, yeah, it does strike me that one of your themes is the agency that comes with skill, yeah. even if obtained under the worst of conditions. I think about uh, you know some of the um, people, you, you talk about certain makers who are enslaved. One that uh, I'm particularly interested in is David Drake or Dave the Potter. And you talk about you know the agency that in this case, he's, he's people on the um, call know him, he's throwing pots that are so much larger uh, than anyone in his orbit. And as a result is uh, the best the best craftsman around and talk about the kind of agency that comes with that or how makers can find that. Yeah, so that'll be a familiar uh, example to many listeners, of course. Um, you know, the, the striking thing about uh, David Drake's or David the Potter's work, of course, is that it becomes articulate through the addition of text as well. So we have his voice in a way that we obviously lack the voices of so many other African-American makers, many of whom, by the way, would have been just as skilled, whether they were blacksmiths or house builders or seamstresses or barbers, which I think is really important. Southern black craft that, again, mostly is forgotten because it left no material trace. Um, and I mean, what can you say about that? It's, it's incredibly moving and powerful to confront those objects, like the amazing one that you have at the MFA, Boston, which I think it says, I made this jar for cash, though it's called lucre trash, or something like that. Okay. Um, and so there you have this kind of amazing meditation on the commodity status of the very thing that he's making, mm -hmm. as he's making it. So it's very high level thinking. And it just, but to me, what it says is, 
what about all the other high level thinking that we don't have? I see. I see. I that's see. that's the thing. I mean, I can't. That's the thing I can't let go of when I look at those objects. Is that they're one of an infinite number of examples, and it's almost the only one of those infinite number that we actually have to look at and think about. Right, right. Yeah, that that's very beautifully said. It does make me think, though, that, you know, one striking thing for me about the book is how many makers were also writers. And, uh, you know, you're, you're looking less at works uh, of art than at words and words um, written by makers. And, you know, when I was thinking, like, because you've probably surveyed the liter artisanal literature of America, like, well, first of all, just, you know, should they have kept their day jobs? You know, what was it like to wade through all this? <laughs> and secondly, like, is there a kind of genre? Is there a, are there patterns? Are there trends uh, within, um, could, could, could you call, could you think of it as a genre across 300 years? Yeah, um, that's a really sharp observation there, Ethan. And um, I think I have to say, it hadn't occurred to me before you said that, but I think methodologically, a social historian might identify that as a real weak point in the book, because the fact that I'm relying on biography, which usually involves relying on a fairly rich narrative that I can get a hold of, someone like Elizabeth Keckley, for example, who wrote an autobiography that I can use to tell her story in her own words. Um, maybe I'd just to parenthetically say, it was also very important for me to use the words of these other of these people from other times and these various demographics rather than speaking for them. Mm -hmm. So I tried to use a lot of evocative quoted language, James Pennington, the fugitive blacksmith would be another great example of that. Um, so that methodology methodology I think is is quite sound, but it's not very representative because of course most craftspeople precisely didn't leave behind those stories. So I'm sort of using the exceptions to prove the rule, mm -hmm. which, you know, maybe if you were if you were really after fine-grained social history of craft you might approach it in quite a different way that was more statistical and less narrative for example and some of that work has been done but um you know at the end of the day i was trying to write something that would also be quite readable yeah. and sort of hard to put down uh, ideally and um you know my models were people like jill lapore for example um where it's, it's like nonfiction that reads like fiction, you know? So for me, the, the human factor became really important, I suppose. So that's, that's the book I ended up writing. Yeah, well, no, the book certainly has that kind of, you know, uh, one, one, one chapter to the next and uh, that, that sort of bite. You know, I wanted to ask, we, we have some questions coming in, which I'll um, turn to in a minute. And I invite people to please put your questions in, in the chat. But Glenn, you know, you told this story and you tell the story in the book of uh, when you see this question on the wall, can craft save America? And it's one question among um, a number that students have uh, raised in their seminar and it just kind of hits you. And of course, like uh, the question um, is now going to go to you. So tell us, tell us, tell us what's happening. You know, this, this book was published on the eve of uh, an even more divisive season than you were writing it in. And by the way, you know, you talk you talk about this kind of trope of the flag. Well, Glenn and I have talked about what happened to the flag on um, January six when uh, it moved from quilting to uh, the kind of stat your policeman staff and was actually used to uh, violently as as a kind of weapon. So, Glenn, tell us, can craft save America today? Yeah. So. Of course, that's one of those questions that you have to maybe define your terms a little bit. <laughs> but it, it's true that I did write it before the pandemic really settled in. But because of the delay in publication date due to the um, pandemic, I was actually able to write a few new passages that reflected on what I mentioned before, you know, um, craftspeople pitching in to try to help protect their communities. So there's that a narrow sense in which craft is not the last resort, but it certainly is a resort for culture on, at times of crisis and stress. Um, but I think there's also a more general sense in which it does offer a kind of cultural salvation simply in that it's the most accessible form of creativity that we have. So, you know, it's very, very reassuring not only to make things yourself, but also to be surrounded by other people who can. And I always think, you know, the reason it was Paul Revere, I mean, it wasn't just Paul Revere, 
But the reason that Revere was one of the people that went on the midnight ride was because he was trusted. Why was he trusted? Because he was a silversmith and silversmiths hold all this value, literally basically coinage in their hands. And they are quite literally pillars of their community. And I, I really think that's still true. And I think also that to the extent that any country lacks its craft base, it's gonna lack something of that trusted citizenry. And so to me, the reemergence of a kind of craft revival, which as I say, it has a lot to do with digital marketing possibilities and Instagram, you know, that, that's probably as important as anything else in terms of why it's happening. It's just becoming more economically viable than it was in the pre-internet days. But I think the effect is that it's giving people a sense of uh, a kind of community solidarity as is manifested not only in the objects, but the places that these things are made and the people that are actually doing the making. It really is like a, a kind of moral skeleton for the culture. And I know that sounds a little bit ambitious, but I, I really do think it's true. And I think it really speaks to something that's hardwired into us as people, not just as Americans, but as people. Um, I like, we like that hopeful note. And um, you, your, your uh, comment brings me to one of a great question I see here about, um, you know, you're talking about the American experience, but also how we're maybe hardwired. And we have a question about, can you talk about immigrant experiences being reflected in craft? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you so much for asking that. And in fact, I, I guess if I were to say who are the real protagonists of the book, of course, they're individual people, but they for, fall really into four groups, African Americans, Native Americans, uh, women and immigrants and the white working class, who of course are often the same people, right? So immigrants and children of immigrants, Irish, Italian, um, Eastern European, um, Jewish from all over. And um, not only do they form a very large part of the skilled workforce in the 19th century and 20th century, um, and obviously earlier than that too, but you know, in terms of sheer numbers and volume of immigration, it's huge in the 19th century and early 20th century. Um, but um, they often bring with them the knowledge that's going to actually make craft excellence possible in this country at the same time that they're facing a lot of uh, disdain, hostility from native workers and all the rest of it, all the stuff that we know about. So that's a very, very important strand within the book. So glad to be asked about it. By the way, I, I was very reliant on the work of Tyler Anbinder um, in writing the book, who's, who's got, who's done a lot of really, really great work on the history of American immigrant culture. So I would super recommend his work to people who are interested in it. City great. of Dreams would be a great place to start. Um, question about um, craft movements, you know, that try and bring together politics, art, craft, uh, and there's a mention of the Roy Crofters and the Wiener Werkstatter. How do you know, where, where, where is craft in these movements and do we have anything like that today? Yeah, um, another great question. Um, so I was, in, the, in fact, that we haven't almost even mentioned the arts and crafts movement and the studio craft movement up till now is sort of intentional on my part. Um, because what I was really, really trying to do was decenter those from the core of the narrative. Because other books of the kind that I would normally encounter, museum catalogs, etc., you would think craft history really is the arts and crafts movement, studio craft movement. And I, I think it, it's a very marginal. Um, fascinating but marginal and highly problematic set of phenomena, in fact. So, mm -hmm. of course, I talk about the histories of those movements, and I also do see some resemblances today, particularly to the arts and crafts movement and also to the counterculture of the late 60s, which is another kind of craft movement, maybe. But I also think that um, the artistic, the genuine artistic nature of craft and I'm, I'm highly aware that Helen Drudd is in the audience, who was the very first uh, craft gallerist in this country and one of its greatest champions from an artistic point of view. Um, and particularly with knowing that these words are going to land in her, her, her ears, what I wanna say is that the artistic qualities of craft have to do with individual capability and vision, not to do with movement dynamics, right? So what 
Elizabeth Keckley did is just as artistically valid as anything Gustav Stickley or Adelaide Robineau did, even though she was not involved in a craft movement. And I think that pervasiveness of human ingenuity and aesthetic excellence really needs to be respected and that movement logic needs to be put in its place, which is not nowhere in the history, but it doesn't deserve the kind of um, pull position that it's had. Yeah, you do bring a, a, a their point in the book when you you know use your word baggage, the baggage of the movements, and how they're as much about exclusivity as they are about some kind of utopianism. Yeah, uh, for sure. And Glenn, there's a question back to our discussion about the agency of enslaved craftsmen. Um, do you see that as a means of resistance through the power of concealed knowledge? Oh, wow. That's yeah. an incredible question. Um, so the first thing to say is that the Underground Railroad quilt thing, that's false. <laughs> so that's what's lying behind the question. I don't know if, if it's something people were thinking about, but sadly, I mean, that's, that's one of those things you'd love to be true, but this whole thing about hanging quilts as a way of signaling on the Underground Railroad, fake news, sorry. Um, so is it a form of resistance? You know, I'm gonna hear, just mention the work of Tiffany Momin, who is a historian who's now doing a lot of work on black craftspeople, both during and after the period of enslavement. And I, I'm trying to think what she would say to that question. And I think probably <laughs> she would say something like resistance is too simple a way of looking at it because in most cases resistance, resistance wasn't really possible. Now you did have some craftspeople, a great example would be Denmark Vesey, who was an artisan who led an unsuccessful craft revolt. Uh, so he's like the Paul Revere of enslaved black people, you could say. Um, although again, his revolt was unsuccessful. So there is that. But I think in most cases, you know, enslaved people were operating on the level of trying to survive and make it possible for their family members, if they had any with them, to survive. And in that context, craft was more like a lifeline than a weapon, but it was critical. And then you think about something like Dave's Potts and you think, okay, well, is that resistance? It's certainly agency, it's certainly articulacy. Maybe it's sort of beyond any simple um, contrast between servitude and resistance and it's into something more about humanity would be a better word perhaps. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we just have to be very realistic about the hopes that we bring to objects made in those circumstances, frankly. Mm -hmm. I try to be quite humble about that in the book really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and maybe we'll end on on the note of what we bring to objects. Um, you know, many many of the people on the call are museum museum uh, goers, museum curators. Once yeah. we read the book, how do you want people who have read and digested what you've uh, brought forth here, this achievement, to to see objects in museums or objects from the past differently? What what questions say uh, for should the reader of craft in American history bring to the gallery? Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of curious almost to know your answer to that, even because you're the one in the hot seat there um, at the MFA. But obviously, this has come up in the Crafting America show at Crystal Bridges and other things that I'm doing now. I think the number one thing I would say is that it, it just gives you a different context for appreciating the objects that we already know and love, you know? Um, and some of this work has already been done, like Jennifer Anderson's work on where does mahogany come from and what are the narratives of labor that are involved in actually making a mahogany high chest in Philadelphia in the 1750s. Like, let's get that into the field of view and not only talking about the excellence of the carving or the appointments of the houses in which those objects sat. Um, so some of it is just enlarging the frame not not abandoning the kind of aesthetic reverence that we already had, but almost using it as the motor to navigate that broader picture. So that's definitely the most important thing. And I guess the other thing would be to think about museums as storytelling uh, venues in the same way that a book is, but using different techniques, because obviously you don't have the ability to plop someone in an armchair and tell them the story at such length, you know, you have a 75 word label and you have juxtaposition and arrangement in a gallery. But in some ways the goal is the same. 
to get across the kind of emotional weight and philosophical gravity of the topic as well as the beauty and richness of the objects. And again, not to see those as oppositional, mm -hmm. but to see them as actually fueling one another. Mm -hmm. So I, think, I do think that's a great mistake that people fall into when having the little culture wars that we sometimes have in the decorative arts world, for example, in museums, of thinking that you either have to choose between connoisseurship or social history. And to me, connoisseurship and social history should be like the warp and weft of a textile. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they absolutely are shot through one another and mutually supportive. Yeah, it's a great image. And um, I'm gonna turn to Helen in a second, but I just wanna say, I love the idea of enlarging the frame. And, you know, sometimes we're asked, we're trying to bring the um, fuller stories of these objects into our own galleries. Uh, and I know many of my colleagues are as well. And sometimes that means um, talking about some of the more uncomfortable sides of our past. And I'm often asked, well, you know, why don't you just take the object off view? Why are you uh, uh, defaming it through, uh, you know, being articulate, being explicit about its connection to slavery or oppression? And quite the contrary, I think, uh, for all of us in museums, as you're saying, this is a way of asking new questions and deepening uh, understandings. So, Glenn, uh, Helen, you have a few more thoughts, and then we'll say good night. Yeah, I'm, I'm, thank you so much, both of you, uh, for a truly enlightening discussion. Uh, we're getting lots of uh, wonderful questions and feedback, in addition to the ones that we've already had. So, I just want to make sure that uh, we, if you, if you don't mind taking a few extra minutes, sure. Um, are there any differences in the way the British and the Americans approach their histories of craft? Oh, yeah. Um, so, uh, as uh, Ethan said in his introduction, I spent eight years in Britain working at the V&A and um, also married to a British woman. So I have very, very strong ties over there. Um, so yes, is the answer. Uh, probably don't have enough time to try to run, run them down. Um, but first thing I want to say is that the work of Tanya Harrod who wrote this incredible book called The Crafts in Britain in the 20th Century, which is truly the best book of craft history that's ever been written. Um, that was super, super important to me as a model. Um, and I edit the Journal of Modern Craft with her, along with Ned Cook, who trained both Ethan and me at Yale, who's also been a huge inspiration for me. So um, that's really like a standing on the shoulders of giants thing. And again, I'm kind of wondering what Tanya would say to this question, but what I'm gonna say is that in Britain and then especially in Europe, craft has a very different role because first of the historic guild system as the basis of identity for craftsmanship. And as I briefly mentioned earlier in the conversation, America never had that well-organized guild system because the population was too transient. It wasn't possible to exert the kind of controls that you would have in you know, Paris or London or um, any of the large European cities. So in a funny way, that sense of guild identity and organization of trades continues right down to the present day. And you still have the work, Worshipful Company of this and that in London that are really important platforms of con continuation of conversation around these different skills and different techniques. So that's really important. And the other thing is that design is a totally different situation over there because design in Europe is a much more intellectual um, enterprise and is much more connected to the art school world and thereby has grown this kind of design history field as well, which is what I was trained in to some extent and what I taught for a long time. So there's a kind of ready equation between design and craft in Europe that's not nearly as explicit here because design here is much more of a mass production kind of situation. And of course, a lot of this has changed in, in recent years because you have more of these independent uh, makers um, who sort of hover in the design art craft, you know, Venn diagram in a sort of undefined way. But certainly if you went back 20 or 30 years, you would see a much stronger affinity between design and craft in let's say Scandinavia or the Netherlands or Italy, but also in Britain. So it just changes the dynamic of the territory a lot. And of course, the political histories of, are completely different. So you have the history of empire. That's another big difference, which we probably don't have time to get into. 
Could you repeat the title of that book that you mentioned? Uh, Tanya's book is um, The Crafts in Britain in the 20th Century. Crafts in Britain in the 20th Century. Yale University Press, 1990, I think, something like that. Great. Um, another question uh, was, sorry, was your approach in selecting and interpreting works for the Crystal Bridges show similar to your aim for this book, i.e. telling the American history through the lens of craft? Are there any objects in that show that are, un, uh, that are as unexpected as some of the little known objects or makers that you've discussed in your book? Yeah, th there's some of that. Um, a great example that actually comes up both in the book and in the show is a chest of drawers that was made by somebody called Kenneth um, Gentaro Hikagawa, who was a skilled Japanese joiner who was incarcerated in one of the Japanese so-called internment camps during World War II. Shock, another shocking chapter in uh, American history, unfortunately. Um, and he, this is amazing, but he actually helped train or retrain George Nakashima, who you've all heard of, who goes on to be the, one of the leading studio furniture makers in the post-war era. Before Nakashima met Hikigawa, he was an architect and a designer, but he wasn't a woodworker in that way. And so he always credited Hikigawa with, with um, really enlightening him to the amazing possibilities of Japanese joinery. And we actually have this incredible chest that Higawa made in that camp that's made of salvaged um, boards from shipping crates and scrub, scrub brush for the handles because it's literally all he had. He was in the middle of a desert and he wanted to make furniture and otherwise beautify the situation. So there's definitely some overlap. I guess the thing I would say though is that the Crystal Bridges show because it's the Crystal Bridges is really an art show. Like really, I mean, it's, it, that's an art museum. The point was to show the relevance of craft to the post-war history of American art. And of course, a lot of what my book is about is, you know, how do buildings get built? What about plumbers? What about, you know, union, uh, union politics? And those aren't art conversations. So it's a very different focus in that sense. So there's some overlap, but there's also a lot of differences. Great. Um, the Crystal Bridges, uh, sorry to interrupt, but the Crystal Bridges show does have a book that will be out in just a week or two. It's called Crafting America. What is what is that one called? It's called Crafting America. <laughs> yeah, you. University of Arkansas Press is publishing it with Crystal Bridges. Thank you. Uh, in the 70s, the precursor of MAD exhibited a juried exhibition of young craftspeople in various categories, such as glass and textiles, that really helped their careers move forward. Is there any other organization doing that today? Ooh, <laughs> yeah, a lot, a lot. Um, you know, I'm not sure if the question knows this, but I was the director of MAD for three years from 2013 to 16. And so I have a lot of reverence for that history. And in fact, Paul Smith, who just died last year, not of COVID, but during the pandemic. Um, so we haven't really been able to properly commemorate him, um, was, you know, the most amazing of champions of, of uh, craft artists in exactly that period, as the questioner is asking. And we've actually just finished work on yet another project, which is called Objects USA 2020, that is dedicated to Paul's honor and um, is opening again in just a couple of weeks at our and company gallery. And it, I, I mean, this is nobody else's problem, but just because of various delays, these three projects, the book we've been talking about in Crystal Bridges and this Objects USA 2020 show have all happened at the same time, which is a little bit inconvenient and embarrassing, but because um, that also has a book. Anyway, the, the point is that th that is commemorating the 50th anniversary of the original Objects USA, which toured, you know, 30 museums between 1969 and 1974 and was very much the kind of high watermark of the craft movement, the studio craft movement. And for sure, you have a lot of institutions that are supporting that kind of energy today. The energy is different. It's not really that sort of easily identified movement with just the five materials at its heart. It's much more wide ranging, much more diverse in its participation. And the institutions range from still the American Craft Council that, um, that uh, you know, is, is now run out of the Twin Cities that Eileen Osborne Webb founded. Um, still exists, still doing great work. You have many museums, not only MAD, but also in Houston and in, um, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, of course, the Renwick in Washington, DC. 
uh, in San Francisco, the Museum of Craft and Design there. You have many institutions that are supporting um, the, the uh, field. And then you have uh, craft-specific organizations like SNAG and NSICA and so on, you know. So it, it's a long, long list and a long, long story. There's a lot to discover. Do you think that there's an aesthetic paternalism inherent, inherent to connoisseurship that is a class power dynamic? Wow. Um, well, I mean, when you put the question that way, the, almost the answer has to be yes. <laughs> but, it, 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 you know, this is like one of these sneaky historians answers. It, it kind of depends what you mean by connoisseurship, because all connoisseurship means is knowing. Right, that's what the word literally means, right? If you speak French, you see it right away. So if by connoisseurship you mean the Israel Sack good, better, best chart, where you're just gonna assign values based on canons of quality, then yeah, that's super paternalistic. Although by the way, Israel Sack was uh, one of many um, Jewish antique dealer immigrants who without whom we would not have the antiques uh, world that we know and love today or the winter show. So we owe them a lot. So before we get on Israel Sachs case too much, which we often do, it's good to remember that that was a different time and they were very estimable characters in their own right. Anyway, I would like to interpret connoisseurship in that broader frame sense that Ethan and I were talking about where, yes, it means understanding what it involved to make carving of a certain level and what that looks like and how to attribute it, how to um, pin down an object in time and space, but it also means where did the mahogany come from, right? Like to me, that's part of the connoisseurship if you're serious about it. So in that way, I would say it's just as likely to be a tool of enlightenment as paternalism. And it's like any other, other tool that can be used for good or bad. One of, one of the earlier questions that came in, which I think we, uh, I think we might've missed was uh, what, what, what do you mean by the visual revolution? What is your the visual revolution? Visual revolution. Did you use the term? I didn't hear it, but uh, Lita is asking, what do you mean by visual revolution? I said industrial revolution a couple of times. I'm not sure I said visual revolution. I don't remember the visual. Okay. But also the, the concept of the counterculture, which is that sort of late 60s, you know, hippies is <laughs> what people, people tend to say. But I think the word counterculture is really great because it, it implies yes against the mainstream or dominant culture, but it also recognizes that the counterculture is also a culture and it's a culture that was very craft rich. So maybe that was what the listener heard. I don't know. Maybe they can clarify. Yeah. Do you think that there is any uh, tension in US history between both urban and rural crafts? Uh, tension? Well, there's certainly a lot of contrast uh, and there's also a lot of passage between, right? So, um, and a lot of the people in the audience will know this well, the idea of the rural craftsperson in the 18th century or the 19th century as isolated and essentially divorced from urban um, centers of trade, that is, that's, I mean, that's really a um, viewpoint that was completely demolished already in the 1970s at Winterthur and hasn't been reconstructed successfully, right? So we have to understand the rural-urban divide as being quite porous to the extent that it is a divide. Certainly you do have, I mean, all you have to do is look at a political map from the recent election to realize that there's a lot of ideological differences between urban and rural culture in America. And that's been true for a long time also. Um, obviously cities tend to have more um, ethnic diversity and more immigrants. Um, and so that changes the craft culture a lot, but I, I wouldn't necessarily say there's anything as simple as a tension between urban and rural and craft history. It's more like different situations that interpenetrate dynamically and often cause friction, but you got kind of got friction every which way. Right. Well, thank you so much. I think, um, I, I know that there are more questions, but I'm also very mindful of our, of the time of our panelists uh, who've been here and, and thank you so much for a really enlightening afternoon. I encourage anyone to send me an email uh, if you have any further questions. My email address is ha at thewintershow.org and I will make sure that, uh, that they get delivered uh, so that you can, you can receive the answers in your inbox.
Uh, we are recording this session and I will be available on the Winter Show's website um, probably tomorrow. So if you wanna go back and re-listen re to rewatch any sessions, uh, we welcome that. I would like to thank also the Magazine Antiques, uh, Greg Serio and Don Sparrison for helping to organize this, this discussion. Uh, they've been strong partners of the show for decades um, and they're wonderful. Glenn and Ethan, I cannot wait to see you in person next year. Yeah. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Amen. That's Fingers right. Crossed. That's right. We'll do it again. Go out there and get the book, everyone. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I want an autograph copy. <laughs> with new eyes. <laughs> thank you so much, everyone. Enjoy, enjoy the rest of the week. And, uh, and thank you for joining us. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.